Welcome to Witnessing Christ. Witnessing Christ is a truth and love ministry podcast designed to help biblical Christians witness to their Mormon friends, family, and missionaries. For more Bible-based resources, check out tilm.org. We have all kinds of resources to support you, including classes, witnessing scenarios, books, and so much more. Visit tilm.org today. Hi, this is Casey. This is John. And this week in the Witnessing Christ podcast, we are looking at Matthew chapter 14, Mark chapter 6, and John chapters 5 through 6. John, would you give us a summary of what's covered in those chapters? Sure, Casey. The question I keep coming back to in this section is uh, Jesus basically confronting us with, where do you turn? So you see it in the uh, feeding of the 5,000. He encourages his disciples to turn to him for their needs. And then his, his Bread of Life sermon that follows, he encourages the crowds, don't just turn to me for your physical needs, but for the much greater spiritual needs I came to fulfill. Um, we see Jesus walking on the water, so then, of course, impetuous Peter wants to do that too. But the moment he turns away from Jesus, he begins to sink. Many wanted Jesus on their terms, rather than for who he really was, and so they turn away. But in that moment, Peter makes a beautiful confession, and he says, Lord, to whom shall we turn? You have the words of eternal life. And friends, when we see Jesus for who he is and what he came to bring, we can make Peter's confession ours as well. What in this week's readings, uh, Casey, do you have questions about, or what stood out to you? Well, Let's start in John. Um, the first thing that jumped out to me was John chapter 5, verse 18. Uh, in that verse, it said, he was making himself equal with God. What does that mean? Yeah. So here we see Jesus in the preceding verses has healed a paralytic. And this paralytic guy, by the way, doesn't uh, seem to necessarily have faith in Jesus. He's faith more in a superstition, being by that pool, wants to be there when the angel stirs it up and, and Jesus heals him, of course, on the Sabbath. People are really upset with this now healed paralytic, uh, and saying, why are you carrying a mat? And then, and by the way, who did that to you? And they're upset that Jesus healed this man on the Sabbath. And so then Jesus identifies himself with the Father and says, hey, the Father is always at work. Jesus shows he's above the spiritual or the, the Sabbath laws. And as a result, he's identifying himself, and they get it, equal with the Father. Now, Casey, one of the things, just to be clear, uh, so that there isn't misunderstandings, in Mormonism, <clears throat> They recognize Heavenly Father as, as uh, sometimes referred to as Elohim. So they see Heavenly Father as God. They, in a very different way, refer to Jesus, Jehovah. This is when we think in our Bibles of um, L-O-R-D in all capital letters, God's personal name. They see that as Jesus. And so they see Jesus as a God. But he's not equal in, in the sense that they would see Heavenly Father. For example, they'll pray to Heavenly Father, and they'll end in the name of Jesus. There are different uh, kingdoms of heaven in Mormonism where if you go to the highest level, you'll live with Heavenly Father, uh, celestial kingdom. If you live in the terrestrial kingdom, the middle kingdom, then you would live with Jesus. So even there we begin to see there's some, some distinctions in the way in which uh, they they see. But here, this verse, which you identified, Jesus shows that he is equal with God the Father. And and that is a verse that I might camp out on and, and spend more time with. It's clear that um, the Jewish leaders knew what he was claiming to do. Um, but because they don't believe this, they're going to try and kill him. Tragically, this happens so often. When people don't see the greatness of who Jesus is, they minimize and miss out on what he really came to do. Mm -hmm. There's so many who try to put Jesus in a box of their own making, but then, like you said, you miss out on who he is and what he came to do. So the larger Jesus is, 
the greater his power to help us. Now, isn't that a great picture of faith, right? When Jesus is, is looms large, what, what a mm-hmm. beautiful picture of faith then. Jesus will warn of uh, denying him. He says in a couple of verses later, whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. I think this is also a verse I might draw out carefully with our LDS friends. Uh, they would never want to do anything in a way that would diminish or dishonor the Father uh, or, or do anything to insult him. And yet Jesus kind of squarely puts this uh, in, in front of him on our laps in a way that says, hey, if you don't lift him up, as he just said in the previous verse, equal to God the Father, why then you actually are doing that very thing of dishonoring the Father. Mm. So when those verses are in context are paired together, I think, it, it really gives us something to just just put in their laps to, to, to think on. Okay. I would say a caution is in order. Um, I wouldn't go toward the Trinity. Mm. Just go to the nature of God. Jesus and what he's saying, he's, he's being equal, and just let that sit. Um, Mormonism is going to really struggle with Trinity because uh, for a variety of what levels, first of all, uh, they consider themselves uh, to be having the potential to become God someday. And so it, it's hard to imagine then if you raise up man and lower God that God would be of a construct or nature that you could not conceive of or become yourself someday. So hmm. for that and maybe some other reasons, um, don't probably go to Trinity at this point unless it's maybe someone who is already one foot out the door and they are really struggling with LDS teaching and then just pursue that if they're ready for it. Okay, that was really helpful. Um so another major event in this section was the feeding of the 5,000. A uh, very, very memorable, memorable and well-known section. I was really struck this time by Jesus' startling statement. He said, you give them something to eat. Right. I never caught that <laughs> before. <laughs> um, but he didn't even offer to do it himself initially. He just said, okay, you guys, you guys can take care of it. Casey, I have often wondered, how in all the world did Jesus say that? You give them something to eat. <laughs> uh, in a way, was he challenging them? And he had sent them, a right, to uh, cast out demons. And so some commentators will even say, you know, maybe, relying, of course, on the power of God, could they have actually done that? But, of course, they they don't. They turn inwardly to themselves and and. And they're like, well, how are we supposed to do that? Uh, the section from Matthew 14, he, he describes it this way. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have only here five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. I, I think about that, how he's really challenging them. In the moment of their need, where are you going to turn? Will you turn first to yourselves? Because in a way, Philip really failed the test then. Um, or will you turn and rely on the power of God? I I think the LDS lesson, uh, they're going to come at this from a different perspective. And this so that whole concept of where are you going to turn in your time of need is really an important one. Mm-hmm. Um, a quote from, from their lesson says this, You and I can give what we have to Christ, and he will multiply our efforts. What you have to offer is more than enough if you rely on the grace of God. This is really a perspective on Jesus plus theology, right? Jesus can add to or multiply our efforts, but at the end of the day, it would still just come down to our efforts. Mm. You know, it makes me think, Casey, that the concept of a Jesus alone, turn to him alone, 
is really a foreign approach, foreign concept for our LDS friends, but it is an important one. And so I, I would use these miracles of Jesus. I would share personal stories from your own life and ways in which anytime I turn to myself, how it failed, and instead look to maybe even the disciples it failed when they did that, but then look to what happens when we turn to him alone. Mm-hmm. And how he fulfills our needs. Yeah. He fulfills our needs. So in Mark 6, it actually talks about uh, the bread of life and how Jesus fills our spiritual needs. So how do you think that you would explain on that idea? Um, that, again, is found in Mark chapter 6. Uh, you know, is what Jesus gives, the very best of what he has to offer, achieved or is it received? You can go up down the line, right, whether it's forgiveness, whether it's um, uh, providing for our physical needs. Uh, in each case, it's what God gives. And that's why it's so important to turn to him and him alone. Do we, do we trust that, you know, taste and thee, the Lord is good? Do we, do we trust that he is a, a good God who, who freely gives and wants to provide for his children? Or, or do we make it so that we think we have to be worthy, that we have to live up to his expectations, and that only then, then he will provide. Uh, Jesus is making it clear again and again in his bread of life sermon, believe, believe, believe. This is the way through which uh, you will have um, gifts from him. Uh, Whoever eats this bread, really trusting in him, having faith, has eternal life, and he will raise them up on the last day. So that recurring theme of, of believe. Now, there were other things that he said, I think, uh, using uh, language where he, he describes himself as that bread, whoever eats my flesh. Okay, we understand that. But but really, I think what was even more difficult for the people of the time was the him reiterating over and over, believe. And isn't that a hard teaching? Mm-hmm. That even today, people will leave Jesus for. But there must be something I can contribute, something I must do. And his bread of life sermon just says, believe. So the last major section in in, uh, these readings that I wanted to highlight was the account of Jesus walking on the water. Such a classic. Again, um, a question may be, why would Jesus show his power in this way? In so many ways, this section, he's showing his power by providing. Here he's showing his power that when the storms of life come, that he's there, right? Uh, he's, he's walking out on the water. He clearly has power over nature. So no matter what storms may come, you know, we can think of a variety of different ways storms in life come. He shows on a, a number of fronts, I have power over that. And I think what a, what a tremendous comfort. So to see him walking on the water, uh, Jesus is saying, I've got this too. Um, power over nature. I, I'm amazed, uh, again, how Peter, I, I love Peter in the sense that he says, okay, if you're walking on the Lord, I want to do this too, Jesus. And it tell me to come. And Jesus, okay, come. But then what we find is, I don't know if something breaks his, his, his line of sight with Jesus or, or if he just looks down or he, see, he feels the wind, he, maybe the waves splashing, he's hearing them. It was a storm. And, he, and he, it seems like he breaks his focus on Jesus, and, mm-hmm. and he starts looking at the surrounding storm, and maybe in that way focusing on him. I, in our staff today, we were talking about how any time we rely on ourselves, whether it's, you know, maybe Peter had an impression like, hey, I got this, you know, I'm walking on water. I mean, okay, you just in that moment relied on yourself and, and to pride, or maybe it was the other way here with Peter where I can't do this, but still he's relying on himself and he's then despairing. Either way, focuses on ourselves. It's only in that middle where we focus on, on Jesus and, and then we can walk on water, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Trusting in his power. Yeah, that's a great reminder during the storms of life because we all have them. We're all going to go through them. And just to remember, where am I going to turn? If I'm going to turn to myself? <laughs> down I go <laughs> we're gonna sink 
<laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, what verses or concepts might might we cover in this section that will be different than how LDS might understand them? Yeah, so Jesus in his hometown of Nazareth, uh, it seems, doesn't do many miracles. And and he says that they lack faith. The LDS will make a connection to, see, Jesus can only do uh, miracles based on faith. And, and I think we have to be cautious with that. Faith is a conduit through which we receive God's blessings. But we remember initially in John 5, that paralytic he didn't even know who Jesus was. He was superstitiously just focusing on, uh, get me into that pool. Mm-hmm. So uh, there wasn't really faith, and yet there was healing in that case. Uh, I, I would say, <clears throat> as we've talked in, in previous podcasts, um, it's just so important to understand that, that Jesus wanted to use these miracles to draw attention to especially who he was because of what he had to offer them spiritually. And and that's, I think, why we see, because there is no faith, they're not going to receive the message that, that he has to offer. And so we don't see um, miracles as maybe we, we would in other places. It's not necessarily because he can only do things contingent upon our faith. Okay, okay. Uh, so also, going back to the feeding of the 5,000, um, in the LDS commentary for that section... Uh, we read, this is a quote, in order to receive nourishment or spiritual bread from the Savior, we must become part of his kingdom, which is well organized here on earth. Fascinating, because whereas biblical Christians believe that we have this direct access to God, direct access to Jesus, the LDS church serves as sort of a separation uh, it's it's like a mediator of sorts, and so they would say their direct connection is through the hierarchy of the LDS Church, and so many times when they think about their faith, they will say, "Do I believe in the Book of Mormon? Do I believe Joseph Smith was a true prophet? Do I believe the LDS Church is the true?" And in each of these cases, it's really more about a connection to an institution. And and one of the things, friends, that we can do is just try and cut the clutter and say, you know, your connection is direct to to Jesus. Turn to him and and cut out the middleman. So I think, but be aware that they're going to um, approach it through the hierarchy of the LDS Church. Right. We actually have a great article on Be, Be Ye Perfect about having direct access to God. So it starts by talking about the barrier between humans and God in the Old Testament. And then it continues on to how Jesus changes everything for us. Here's a quote. The sacrificial death of Jesus removed the wall of sin. Now we have direct access to God. God isn't just accessible for you to plead your case before him someday. If that were true, the veil would remain until judgment day. Instead, Jesus won direct access to God for you right now by removing the wall of sin. God now credits believers with Jesus' flawless record. Nothing can separate you from God's love. Not now. Not ever. Direct access. Oh, I love that quote. Um, you know, speaking of the Old Testament, there's another section in John 5 um, that talked a little bit about the law. So can you walk through how LDS will see the law in that section? <laughs> Yeah, uh, they when they look to Jesus, will not so much think of him as a, a law keeper, but another law giver. Here's a, here's a quote. They, they say, Moses gave schoolmaster laws, and they're actually quoting Galatians 3.24, a verse that we frequently use to teach the law drives us away from trying to... Mm. Uh, find our, our hope in, in, in our obedience, but instead drives us to Christ. But they, they'll view it as Moses gave schoolmaster laws specifically designed to prepare them for the, and here it is, higher laws mm. the Messiah would give them. Uh, this reminds me of a recent episode of The Chosen. So if those friends who might be following this... Um, they actually took a quote from the Book of Mormon 
And they have Jesus saying, I am the law. That is somewhat startling to biblical Christians because nowhere in the Bible would Jesus say, I am the law. He is not another law giver. That's not what we need. We need a law keeper. And that's why it's so important to emphasize with our LDS friends that Jesus came as our substitute. There's a huge difference between a law giver and a law keeper. Right. And we covered that in Matthew 5. Matthew 5 verse 17 says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So again, he's not saying I am. He's saying I came to fulfill the laws. I did it. Right. Right. Yeah. There's going to be some other emphasis uh, on the, the LDS, uh, f- the phrase in John 6.60, uh, where they, the people said, this is a hard saying. And they're, they're demonstrating that, oh, we sometimes have hard time believing, even when we don't understand. But they say, just, just trust or, or believe. And, and we can appreciate that to some degree, but Jesus never calls us to blind faith. Mm. It's always a faith that looks to Jesus. So I may not always understand, but I but I look to him. But the LDS teaching on these sections is doubt your doubts and put it on the shelf. And that's a very different thing than just trust in Jesus and look to him in a way that, that he puts everything together, the answer is found in him. This is 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 just ignore it if you don't understand it. Uh, that that's not at all what Jesus was saying in his bread of life discourse. Instead he it was a clear presentation of the gospel that we cannot contribute to eternal life, that this is only possible through faith when we turn to Christ alone. So, John, what are some things that we learn about God in this section, and what do we learn about ourselves? Great question. I think especially for those of you as Christian witnesses out there, I I want you to remember uh, Jesus was rejected in his own hometown. Uh, He didn't give up. He didn't become angry. He doesn't become obsessed with opposition. He just keeps marching on looking for new opportunities. I think that's really important as we run into Uh, LDS, who often will say, I personally, now that I've left the LDS church, maybe can't reach my family. But you, you Christian witnesses, can. And I'm praying for you. Is that not another hometown phenomenon? And I just want all of Christian witnesses out there to remember this. Sometimes we'll go to the door on mission trips or, or, or people are reaching out to LDS missionaries or family or friends. And especially where there's not great opportunity, they are praying that another Christian witness like you will come along and will reach out in a way that they maybe don't have opportunity. So remember with wind in your sails, you have people praying for you when you have these opportunities. Jesus will say, say to uh, shake the dust off of your feet when people don't listen. Uh, I think that's, you know, there's a principle for us in witnessing. Uh, Christians maybe sometimes do that with LDS in a way that say, oh, they've rejected the gospel. And I would say be careful because I'm not sure most have rejected it. Most, my experience, have not had a full airing of it. So be patient and don't give up. But as you continue to work with folks, if if they continue to reject, then maybe you do redirect your efforts in a way that those who especially are leaning in. I also think about the way in which for our Christian witnesses, Jesus demonstrates compassion for the lost. Uh, Again, he he looks out at them uh, with compassion. And isn't that a picture that... through his lenses, we would also approach witnessing, uh, seeing them for lost souls that he, he died for. Right. And John, like you've alluded to, even throughout this podcast, we're reminded of how just truly loving God is. And, I mean, 
think back. He provided food for the 5,000, saved Peter from drowning, and talks about fulfilling our spiritual needs. And he still makes himself available to us and tells us to turn to him. And how great a message that is to share. Turn to him. That's really a theme over and over again. Uh, John 5, verse 39, uh, Jesus says, These are the scriptures with which testify of me. I really think this is one to spend some time with our LDS friends. The Bible isn't first and foremost a rule book. It's a love story. And from cover to cover, it's all about God's amazing, radical love for you and Jesus. If there's ever a section in the Bible you're struggling to understand, then ask the question, where is Jesus in this? And I found that often brings the text to life in ways like never before. So, John, are there any areas to avoid in witnessing? I know we talked about uh, sidestepping the Trinity a little bit. Yeah, I think maybe just going back to John five twenty three, where it says, He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. There's a very powerful verse to share with our LDS friends, but at the same time, tread lightly. Uh, place it on their heart, but don't hammer them with it uh, because y- you could have an adverse effect. Just let the Spirit uh, work that into their heart in a way that that they'll be confronted with it. You can't, uh, finally, we don't do the persuading, right? It's the Holy Spirit who does. And then when we when we place that on their hearts, I think it can help them begin to see Jesus in completely new ways. So if you could witness to Christ from this week's readings, what verses or concepts would you focus on and why? What exactly would you say? (laughs) One of the questions I would just, in a very practical way, talk about is where do you turn? Whether it's those storms of life, whether it's on our times of need, what's our first inclination? Do I turn first to myself, but then look at what happened? when the disciples tried to do that, I can't feed this many people, or uh, Jesus, I'm sinking. Mm -hmm. And in every case, what if we change the script? And in each of those situations, we first turn to him. Because after all, that's where the power is, not in ourselves. How would that not change our entire perspective, not only going through this life, but the next, uh, into the next. Right. And, you know, in that story, when Peter is sinking, it really struck me today as he is looking around wind waves, you know, loses his focus on Jesus. He still cries out. I think he says, Lord, save me. I don't know if that was the exact (laughs) words that he uses. Something that struck me today is that, um, and John, you already mentioned this, that sometimes the LDS may just doubt their doubts or just say, okay, I don't understand that, but I'm still going to trust. If Peter did that, if he just said, oh, well, I'm not, not going to do anything, and didn't just reach and long for Jesus and cry out to him, I mean, he would have sank. But he, but Peter said, Lord, save me. And how how comforting that is for us as Christians that in the middle of a storm, what feels like chaos and (laughs) death in some cases that we still can turn to Jesus and say, Lord, save me. I'm going down. And it just is amazing to me. Doubt your doubts would be almost like hold your breath. Mm. And even while you're sinking, but, but here Jesus, uh, I'm looking to you and you alone. And and, and I, I've even seen some pictures of where they're trying to picture Peter and, and Jesus. Is it is it so much Peter reaching up or is it Jesus reaching mm-hmm. down, right, and pulling him, rescuing him? The, the other section that struck strikes me that I would emphasize, and maybe you haven't mentioned this too much yet, but I am always profoundly struck by the way Jesus speaks about eternal life in John 5 and John 6. So maybe if I just read those quickly, John 5, 24 says, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged. He has 
crossed over from death to life. And then again, we, we see it in a similar way, John six forty seven, where Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. So Casey, mm. I'm profoundly struck, first of all, just for myself, as I probably have always thought about eternal life and equated that with heaven, living forever with God. And I, I do believe there's, there's sections in Scripture where we certainly understand that properly. Mm-hmm. But I'm not sure that we are to understand it as synonymous with eternal life. So if we pull back, maybe if I could take a step back, like death. Death, ultimately, that word means separation. Physical death, separation of body and soul. Spiritual death would be eternal separation from God. That's the worst part of hell. Mm-hmm. But then... If the opposite helps me understand what life is, it's that connection to God. Mm. As great as heaven will be for a place, the best part is being in the fullness of the presence of God and all of his glory. Oh, what a day that will be, right? Mm-hmm. But, but in a sense, he says, look at what you have now. You have, as a present possession, eternal life. When a person comes to faith, and that, that picture over and over again, turning to him in faith, you can face the storms of life. You can face your needs knowing you are not separated from God because you, you already have that connection, that relationship, that life through faith right now. Mm-hmm. And Casey, I, again, I'm not saying to, to if we, we have to pull that back from heaven, I'm not saying in this life everything's going to turn up roses, right? But if, if we understand eternal life as that connection we have with God, well, then how beautiful of a focus that is for LDS friends. Ultimately, that's their goal, to one day striving for eternal life and pointing them to these verses to say, you, as a present possession, have it right now, is going to cause them to lean in and marvel and want to learn more. Mm -hmm. So those are some uh, things that I would particularly emphasize. Because we have that faith connection to Jesus, we can turn to him no matter what we face. So well said. Well, John, would you mind uh, praying us out today? Absolutely. Father, uh, there are so many opportunities, uh, times in life, whether a need or in the storms or finally in our Christian witness where we might turn to ourselves. Help us to turn first in those moments to you and to you alone. We pray that you would guide and bless all the Christian witnesses on the front lines who are sharing that message. Our LDS friends so often are are trained to turn first to themselves. And and we think with heartbreak uh, how often that leads to sinking and and to despair. Use them to boldly point to you and trusting in you alone, help them to see there we have all we'll ever need. We pray for your power. We pray that your spirit would go out powerfully through these words. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. See you next time, friends. Go give them heaven. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Witnessing Christ. Witnessing Christ is a truth in love ministry podcast. For more resources, visit tilm.org. If this podcast and other Truth and Love Ministry resources have been a blessing to you, consider supporting the mission to proclaim Christ to Mormons and empower Christians to witness by visiting tilm.org backslash.